So this is Father Justin from St. Mark's New Canaan. Uh, we had some trouble with the live stream earlier this morning, so I'm uh, coming to you with a brief summary, hopefully brief, um, of what we did today in class. We were beginning our study of Thomas Traherne, who's an Anglican uh, poet and cleric and mystical theologian. Um, Traherne is normally lumped in with other 17th century uh poets, many of whom were also Anglican clerics, uh, the so-called metaphysical poets. Uh, examples include George Herbert and John Donne, etc. So that's sort of the, the group of the cluster of folks with whom he's associated, with whom uh, his work was circulating, running around. In any case, uh, Traherne's theology is really organized around the concept of felicity, by which he means deep happiness or Joy, joy actually might be a better <clears throat> might be a better synonym for felicity than simply happiness. Um, there were three things that we discussed uh, this morning with regard to felicity. Uh, the first of which was our human insatiability. So for Traherne, the human creature is a creature of desire, and this ought to um, this ought to sound very familiar to those of you uh, who have been following us through our exploration of the work of Sarah Coakley. Um, I think that Thomas Traherne has uh, a great deal in common with, well, he's clearly indebted to the early fathers of the church, like uh, Augustine, uh, who famously said in his confessions, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee, O Lord. Um, this idea that the human creature is a creature of desire, and um, the the fact that the point of departure for this mystical theology is an anthropology of desire, really an anatomization of what it means to want something and what it means for the human being to be created in the image of a God who, in God's self, is in some very important sense desirous and wanted. We'll talk about that more next week, as I'll say at the end. Um, in any case, I think that in particular, Gregory, I'm sorry, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, that Traherne has uh, great resonances with the Cappadocian father, um, Gregory of Nyssa, who, is one of, who was one of really the main touch points for Coakley's theology of desire and God's sexuality and the self. In any case, um, the human creature is insatiable. It is totally impossible for the human being to ever be fulfilled. I don't want to say fulfilled, but it's impossible for the human creature's desire to ever be fulfilled such that the desire comes to an end, right? It's impossible ever to be sated such that you don't want anything more. The solution for Traherne, like for Gregory of Nyssa, um, was not that, you know, our desire ceases, but rather that the infinity, the endlessness of our desire is met by the endlessness and infinity of the ultimate object of that desire, at least that desire rightly oriented, namely the endless object who is God, God's infinite nature, and so on. There is always more of God to have, right, even when we have God uh, in the eschaton, etc. So that's... Um, it's a little bit about insatiability. The, the trouble with insatiability, though, is that our, our, our insatiability makes it, I'll put it this way, our insatiability snatches away all of the objects of our desire whenever we happen to acquire them. So uh, it's like this. Okay, so I have an iPhone sitting in front of me, right? Okay, so I bought this iPhone, and one would think, that after I bought this iPhone, that considering how much I had wanted this iPhone, I would be satisfied, right? That my desire would come to an end. I would buy the iPhone, and then finally my desire would rest, right? Well, no, of course not, because human beings are insatiable, me included. And so after I get the iPhone, I want another thing. I want, um, I'm looking at other objects in front of me. I want this glass. I want this computer. I want this table. I want this tablecloth. I want the chair and so on. I move from object to object to object to object to object. And I'm using objects right now, consumer objects. But the sorts of objects of our desire, while including these sorts of everyday consumer objects, um, they might also include things like our ambitions, right? Our desire to have a perfect career or a perfect family or something like that. We always think that what we want will satisfy us, right? And it never does. It never does. 
because human beings are insatiable. It's simply impossible to ever be satisfied by a, an object that isn't an infinite object. The only infinite object, of course, being God. So our insatiability, though, does one, one even better than that, though. It not only it pr propels us toward a new thing, right, but it also it, it makes things as, as we actually acquire them. They almost slip through our fingers, right? I said it snatched them away. We cease to be able to prize the goods that we have obtained. Prize uh, being one of the, the, the key terms of this first century, uh, of the five centuries that constitute uh, the centuries of meditations that, we, that we're going to be looking at. Given the fact that our desire is insatiable, given the fact that as we attain objects of our desire, we are immediately propelled onward to other objects, it can be incredibly difficult to live a joyful life. Because when one is moving from object to object to object to object to object, one is actually not enjoying any of those objects. To enjoy them, Traherne says, is to prize them, to prize them rightly. And those of you who have um, been with us for the, Sarah, the exploration of Sarah Coakley last semester, you'll, um, you should see resonances here uh, to the account given of how to prize something properly um, to the Dionysian notion of hierarchy that Coakley uh, elaborates in that last chapter of God's sexuality and the self, right? The idea that the universe is a meaningful one, that there's an order to all the beings that God has created, a, a creative order, a providential order, and so on, everything in its own place, right? So to prize something properly is to prize it in its proper relationship to me and to God. So we can prize all sorts of things that we've been given, for example, the sun. This is one of Traherne's favorite examples. He loves the sun and the stars, right? Uh, the sun and the stars are magnificent. They're fabulous. They make it possible to, you know, for our uh, for our world to exist in the way that it does. They are objects of great beauty and so on. But we don't prize those objects, right? They're either um, they're they're too um, they're too magnificent in the sense that they're. Their, their magnitude is too large, right? It's, it's, perhaps it's the fact that no any one of us can own the sun or the stars as a piece of private property that almost thins them out as objects um, which could be prized by us, that could be celebrated by us. And yet, there's a part of Traherne's ascetical project that's really trying to cultivate in the human being the capacity to prize things, like the fact that the world was created for my enjoyment. And he actually comes out and he says this, right? We don't enjoy these things. We don't prize them because we think, ah, well, the sun, ah, the sun will be there tomorrow. And the stars, ah, well, whatever. He says that we actually, we have traded the, the, the sun and the stars for glittering rocks, sparkly rocks, sparkly rocks which are scarce, right? They can, they're governed by rubrics of private property. Only one of us can have them at a time. And in the end, what is a sparkling rock as compared to the constellation of the stars? That's the sort of question that Traherne is, is asking. The thing is, is that given the insatiability of our desire, the way it propels us from object to object to object of desire, given the fact that we seem unable to prize the objects of our desire when they are attained by us, we live lives that are basically miserable. We are like um, we're like the story that Traherne tells about the ruler, the young prince, who having conquered all of the world, cries because he has no more worlds to conquer. We simply are insatiable. There's no one doing that. In fact, this insatiability is a good thing. Traherne goes so far as to say that the very impulse in us which leads monarchs to attempt to conquer country after country after country is itself a sign of the dignity of the human creature made in the image of God. It's a kind of clue in us that we were created ultimately to enjoy God. The only infinite object, again, capable of fulfilling the infinity of our desire endlessly, and on and on and on into eternity. The trouble is that we're ungrateful. 
we don't know how to prize anything. We're and this is this is really Traherne's doctrine of sin. It's very easy to read Traherne and think that he's a kind of happy go lucky guy. But in fact, what he's diagnosing is the fact that most of the most of us are simply quite miserable. And learning how to prize the objects of our desire when we have attained them is something quite difficult, given the fact that the infinity of our desire always seems to snatch our contentment in these objects out of our hands as soon as it comes to us. To learn how to prize something properly is indeed a task for the ascetical long haul. One of the ways that you do this is by learning to prize the order of creation, by learning to prize the, the sun and the stars, as I said. I think this is, it becomes most clear in one of the centuries toward, um, toward the middle of what we read for this week, this first set of a hundred chapters. I'm looking at around uh, chapters 46 and 47. So basically, he, he breaks down what it is to be in heaven, what it means to be in what he calls hell on earth, what it means to be in a sort of afterlife hell, in terms of the schematic, the anatomy of wanting, desiring, that he has, uh, that he's put forward. To be in heaven, Traherne says, is to want something, to have that want supplied, and then to prize the thing that has been supplied to you, to prize it, to cherish it, to celebrate it, to give thanks for it. And by so prizing it, you enjoy it. And then you want something else, of course. And that wanting something else is not necessarily a bad thing. You just have to prize what you have been given. Prizing something after it has been supplied to you is how you enjoy it. To be in hell on earth, then, is to have been supplied something and not to prize it. So not to enjoy it, and therefore to be consumed with want without enjoyment, desire without felicity. And to be in hell in the sort of afterlife sense of hell is to prize something properly, namely to prize the presence of God relationship with God, etc. But not to be supplied that thing that one prizes. Hell being defined here as separation from God. And then to want the thing which one prizes, but which with which one has not been supplied. To want it without being able to enjoy it. Desire without enjoyment is hell, either a hell on earth or a, a sort of eternal hell, he says. I think this schematic is just helpful for getting the basic, the key terms of the equation down. So you have wants, supply, prizing, which is an ascetical task, an orientation, an intention, um, a sort of proper reaction, a proper orientation toward objects which have gifts that we have attained, and um, and enjoyment, felicity. Next week, we're going to move on to the second set of 100 chapters, the second century. Um, so if you're so inclined, you can go ahead and start reading that. Um, but where I want to begin next week is with something that I'm, that I'm only, able to, only able to gesture to right now. Um, there's quite a bit said, actually. Um, I think it's shocking and uh, shockingly creative. Uh, in this first century about the the fact that God, God's self for Traherne, is a being of infinite desire. A being whose infinite desire, whose infinite want, is always supplied, and of course always being prized properly, and so uh, a God of infinite enjoyment. But a God who wants, a God of desire, a God of need and supply, nonetheless. We need to look at that a little bit, because ultimately, what the human creature is supposed to do is the human creature is supposed to enjoy in God. We're supposed to participate in God's own felicity. 
He says it like this in chapter 51 in this first set of centuries, in a paragraph that combines his idea of participation in God's enjoyment and what I was suggesting earlier about the fact that our insatiability, while an ambivalent and even dangerous part of the human creature's constitution, is really a sign of our dignity as being created in the image and likeness of God. It's a kind of clue left within us to lead us back to the only object capable of fulfilling the endlessness of our desire. He's doing a combined in this last paragraph, which I just want to read, read for you in closing. Wants are the bands and cements between God and us. Had we not wanted, we could never have been obliged. Obliged here meaning something like dependence, right? We could have never been dependent on God, obliged to God, had we not stood in need of something, had we not wanted for something. Whereas now, we are infinitely obliged because we want infinitely. From eternity, it was requisite that we should want. We could never else have enjoyed anything. Our own wants are treasures. Though our wanting, Trocker is saying here, is ambivalent and dangerous. Wanting is integral to joy, in, <laughs> integral to enjoyment, integral to our experience of felicity and deep happiness. When we realize this, even our own wants, even our own desires, desires, qua desires, just as desires, are treasures, things over which we can rejoice, and prize. And if want be a treasure, Trahern continues, sure, everything is so. Wants are the ligatures between God and us, the sinews that convey senses from him into us, whereby we live in him and feel his enjoyments. Trahern's mysticism is aimed at cultivating in those who read its very exposition, who, the, the, just the people who read the book, right? Designed to cultivate in those readers the felicity of which he speaks. A felicity which ultimately is intended to be a participation in, a feeling of God's own enjoyment, God's pleasure. It's a marvelous promise. We'll see how the rest adds up. Many thanks. God bless you.